climate change affects everything that we do. Um, you know, even though we're in the middle of the United States, uh, it affects uh, weather extremes, everything from extreme rain events that cause flooding to, on the other hand, uh, uh, sometimes droughts, and which, uh, you know, it's connected to fires and other things, and then you get really unusual events that come along, like in our areas, tornadoes. Right. So they can level a whole town, and, uh, you know, it's, a storm can be a mile wide and just go through, uh, and we don't get hurricanes, but, but you get extreme weather events. So in addition to all that, you know, we're in an agricultural area. So um, we are affected by whatever happens on the extreme side of, of weather. So the crops can be affected by too much water or not enough water. Uh, and this year, as a for instance, we had both ends of the extreme. We had the uh, first three, four months of the year were the wettest in recorded history of over 140 years. Mm -hmm. However, during the summer, during the uh, July-August time frame, which is when the crops are supposed to be, you know, growing and, and reaching maturity, we had one inch of rain for the whole two-month period. So it was uh, very unusual, very wet, and then all of a sudden very dry. Um, so we get affected by those kinds of things, and then, of course, we have to protect our citizens. And in the cities, uh, you know, it's not about agriculture. It's about protecting property. It's about saving lives, and it's about how do we do that, and how do we make harden our infrastructure and become a resilient community? How do we prepare? How do we mitigate uh, situations when they present themselves to it? How do we respond? to those circumstances, and then how do we recover and what does it take to do that? Mm. So in terms of a, of a mayor working on these kinds of things, um, coming to an event like this, uh, we're always hopeful that we can get support from national level mm. government, but we have an advantage as local level um, authorities because I can talk to all the people in my state in Iowa, I can talk to them around the country, yeah. but at the end of the day, also, I have friends that are mayors around the world, and we exchange best practices, and we do a lot of different things. We have a program in the United States, for instance, we call Resilient Communities for America. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a similar program that ICLEI uh, runs globally, but it's, we just kicked ours off in the United States this year. Mm -hmm. Day one, when we kicked it off, we had 45 mayors already signed up. Uh, we kicked it off and, and told people why we're doing this. We have to be prepared. Uh, we can't walk away from our jobs. There's an expectation of our citizens, of, their, of our businesses, mm. that we are prepared. And often, some of our circumstances are new and different. So we share best practices and best ideas with other mayors and then try to create that network, uh, mayor to mayor, uh, sort of in a horizontal uh, uh, sure. platform. Yeah, yeah. But then we're hopeful that we can vertically integrate with uh, higher levels of government as well because at the end of the day, we're, we're where it happens. So whatever happens at the international level, at the national level, mm. ends up affecting Des Moines, Iowa, as a for instance. So we need to, to be prepared. We need to see what our, our resources are. We need to see who our partners are, and we mm -hmm. have to try to figure out how we can all work together and share those practices and spread the word so we can not only do it in our community, but hopefully all the communities around the world. What, what can you practically do, though? I mean, it's one thing sharing best practice and discussing various adaptation or um, energy-saving techniques with other mayors, but can you give me an example or some examples of what you've actually been doing um, in Des Moines you know, perhaps energy efficiency or perhaps sure. helping, you know, individual communities or, or areas prepare better for, for um, extreme weather events? Well, government, uh, when I started in this office 10 years ago, I was sort of the green guy and mm -hmm. there was uh, a lot of people that were not believers in climate change and, you know, he's the green guy, he'll kind of go away after a while. And, um, however, is circumstances and flood situations and, and drought situations have presented themselves to us, 
people have slowly become kind of believers, but then the question is, what are we going to do about it? And so we decided that the city, while we can't fix everything for every homeowner and every business, we could begin by leading by example. So we begin to look at our whole city uh, infrastructure. How do we make our, our buildings more energy efficient? How do we, uh, it, and that's in the ones that are existing, if we create a new one, what standard is it that we're going to uh, build to? So we have, in, in our case, we've been reaching out and, and beginning to build to the LEED standard, which is, you know, leadership in energy environmental design, and uh, to start putting that into our, our portfolio, portfolio of, of structures in the city, whether they're maintenance facilities or whether they're senior uh, centers which have our food sites and also um, uh, meeting rooms for our older population mm -hmm. or whether it's a, a library. Uh, our latest library uh, remodel for instance we took a, a library that was 40-50 years old we expanded it doubled its size but we built it to a lead platinum uh, standard and in terms of operation over the last year, 18 months, we've seen significant, depending on the month, up to 82% less energy consumption in that building using photovoltaics, using geothermal, using natural lighting, uh, and in reducing the cost of operating in a building twice the size and operating 82% less than it was at, at the original size, half the size. We're also looking at green infrastructure opportunities because if flooding is an issue, where's the best place to handle water? Generally, it's where it falls. So, you know, we look at bioswales, rain gardens, uh, permeable pavement to try to get the, the moisture back in the soil as opposed to sticking it in the old gray infrastructure uh, concept, which just put it into a pipe and into a, the nearest river as quickly as possible which maybe alleviates part of our problem, but everybody downstream from us then has similar problems. But we're hopeful that we, what we can do is by implementing some of these strategies, we can show some of the people upstream from us mm. that uh, they should implement some of those and maybe it'll help us out. So we look at a whole watershed and, and we do those kinds of things. So, you know, it's all about uh, saving energy. It's all about reusing materials and recycling and repurposing. It's also about, uh, we've had another number of projects looking at alternative energy. Mm. So we capture methane off of our solid waste landfill as well as uh, we've diverted about 30, 40% of our landfill through recycle programs. So we recycle, reuse, repurpose, but the, we're capturing the methane off of our solid waste landfill and using that to uh, uh, run a generator uh, for our mid-American uh, power supplier. We also, in our wastewater, uh, run a, a bioreactor up there that captures methane off of that operation and we sell it to a grain drying operation uh, near to us. Mm. And we, it's a significant amount that, that we capture. Uh, essentially about enough power we get off of those two operations that will uh, probably power 10,000 homes uh, annually. Yeah. Do you think that um, citizens listen more to their local mayors than they would necessarily to their president? I mean, I'm thinking that, you know, President Obama's speech, you know, relating to his national action plan was very inspiring. And I think that many people probably particularly involved in this process were um, perhaps energized by it to hear an American president talking so positively about the actions he was going to take. But when you get down to, you know, sort of local level, um, you know, and it's not for me to blow, you know, your trumpet, but I mean, do, do you think your local citizens, to the peoples of Des Moines, they, are they going to listen more if their mayor talks about this than some bloke in a faraway city who's probably popped through on the election trail? Well, you know, in the, in the case of this president, he's not running again. So, uh, you know, he's out there on the stump doing something uh, that he really believes in. Um, and while he can be inspirational and try to move that forward, when it comes to actual action, they, they look at local government to generally perform. You know, we heard the president, but so what are we doing about it? And, you know, in, in the United States, um, you know, there's lots of... Um, blocks or hurdles that have to be overcome 
including the political process. Uh, sometimes in, in Congress, it's slow to move. The administration, through executive orders, can do certain things, but they can't fund to the level that uh, really needs to happen to, to put some of this uh, resilience and, and efficiency programs and thoughts in, into place. But I believe that, um, and I have been appointed to serve on the, on the President's Advisory Council on Climate Change, and so I'm going to, you know, be able to give you a, a further report at some other time, you know, on that. But we're very, very hopeful that his message is strong, that it'll be heard by people around the country, and they'll ask their local officials, what are you doing? We know what we're doing in Des Moines, and, uh, but I think that, you know, as people look at us, and, and you look at the ratings, and this president, uh, I think people uh, have a, a trust you know, some people might not like everything that, that an administration does, whether it's this president or another one, but they're sort of the national leader. But when it comes to doing and performing, they look to local government, and I think they trust local government on a day-to-day -day basis because they know that if, if the pothole in the street needs to be filled or the garbage needs to be picked up or, you know, the sidewalk needs to be fixed, the president's not going to do that. We're right. going to do it. And I think they have the same feeling regarding environmental issues that we're the ones that they look to to, to come up with a solution. Well, I was going to ask you about that because presumably, um, you know, people's, you know, talking in general around the world, but the main preoccupations for your average person, particularly around election time, are what, education, crime, um, I guess, you know, housing. I mean, how much of a political risk is it to focus on green issues? How do you sell it to your... Um, constituents when you're talking about these issues? Do you talk about the climate science and how you know the IPCC says we should do this or that, or do you set it from an energy, energy efficiency um, point of view? How do you sort of message it to your, to well, your, to your constituents? I guess I would have two answers to that. One is, you know, how would you do it generally? Because I think in, in some cases, uh, there's places in the world where people haven't had some of the, the extreme experiences that uh, some people have, whether they're on a coastal city or, in our case, uh, with tornadoes and floods and extreme rains. And so there, there are still folks out there that are not believers. So the question then is, you know, how do you educate those folks and, and make it happen? We just talk about factual reality. Here's what's happened. Here's what we need to do. Here's why we're doing it. So we're trying to, uh, you know, sometimes you're talking to a faith-based community that may um, have some feeling about stewardship and, and uh, their, their faith and, and uh, what that means. So we speak to them on that level, you know, that they ought to make a better place in the world to live for their kids and their grandkids, and, and, and that is spiritually a, a good thing for them to do. For those that, that want to have, you know, an environmental discussion, uh, we can talk about all the facts and the in the issues and and you know get into the to the weeds on the numbers on that. Uh, for somebody that wants to talk about it uh, as, as it relates to the economy, uh, sometimes we have to make a case for the investment. So we're we're investing in our buildings to lower our cost of operation. We know the cost of energy is going up, and oh by the way, the less of it we use, we can sell it to you know or. or hopefully try to convince people on both sides. If you're an environmentalist, we're lowering uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions as a result of, of the actions that we're taking to the person that's looking at the economic uh, model, we're saying we're saving money. And in the best case scenario, we're doing both. So uh, it it's, it's often depends on, on who your audience is as to, to how you, you talk about it. And generally, I spend a lot of time talking to my constituents. I go to neighborhood meetings. Uh, we in our city have 58 separate neighborhood associations, so I go out there, and if it's an important enough issue, like in the middle of a flood, we'll have press conferences, we'll have town hall meetings, we'll actually get out and, and factually explain the circumstances and then tell them what we need to do to mitigate the, those risks.